All right. Well, you are luckily you are here in week two of our Generous Living series. And believe it or not, this is the last one. We're just doing two weeks on this. Um, now, don't, don't think you're off the hook of talking about money for the next 12 months. We may bring that back up. I'm just reserving the right to address it again um, later on. You know, why do we do this every year? Why do we feel like we need to do this? Well, because money is important in life, isn't it? Money is very important. Um, it is addressed in the Bible more than any other topic. And it's, be, it's addressed because it is a very important topic. Uh, money has a way of running your life, either by its abundance or by its scarcity, or sometimes both. Or the perception of I don't have enough or I've got plenty. And because God wants us to live our lives dependent on Him and not so much on money. And so it's a very important topic that we talk about this week. As I was watching that, that bumper video that got us started, I was reminded of how, um, how your giving has made a difference in lives. Just last Sunday, uh, Connor Summers and Rowan Rincars were baptized in the modern service. They were immersed in our tank that we have back there. You may remember we did some in here as well. Um, it's been interesting over the last year and a half or so we have seen a, a rise in commitments to Christ here and people wanting to follow Christ with their life and wanting to give their life to Christ among our kids and adults as well and, um, and wanting to follow that in baptism and it's been so exciting to be a part of that and it's because of your faithfulness because of your faithfulness to God and wanting to see God work in our community and in the lives of our friends and our family that is all around us. It is important stuff that we do. Two weeks ago, uh, we mailed out a letter with a commitment card that looked like this in it. If you did not get one, it's because we don't have your mailing address. Um, if we have your email, you got kind of a digital version of this with a uh, Google form that had the information from our commitment card on there. And we mailed it out because we want everyone to have an opportunity to participate in kingdom building here at Richmond Hill Methodist Church. Whether you're a member, whether you're someone who just comes all the time, or maybe you're just checking us out, but you like what's going on, and you say, you know what, I want to be a part of that, we want to invite you to be a part of this. If you did not get one, or you conveniently, well, you just misplaced it, we have some of these in the back. You can grab one on your way out. And, um, and what we'd like for you to do is we would really like for all of you to participate. And you say, well, Jay, I don't know that I can commit money. I don't know that I can give you a dollar figure um, for the church. That is fine. The, the first slot on this right over here says, says, I or we will pray for the church in the coming year. And if you can commit to doing that, I wish you would fill it out with your name and your address, so we'll have your address, and just say, look, I'll pray for you. And if, if I can, I'll give. That's fine. But we want to know that our whole church is praying that God's will will be done in this church. That we will do the work of Christ and his kingdom in this church. And so I invite you all and I ask you all, we'd love 100% participation. And um, so fill this out and then you can drop it in the offering plate when it comes around. Or if not, you can mail it or drop it by the church office. We'd just like to have them all back by sep uh, September, November 7th. That's two weeks from today. By the time we celebrate All Saints and we have the fabulous Equinox Orchestra, that's your cue. Get them back to us. Some of them, I actually saw some in envelopes in the offering plate this morning. Thank you for doing that. And um, it helps us uh, be better stewards with what God is blessing us with so we can reach more people for Christ. So I'm very, very excited, and I hope that you will take the time to do that. Today, I hope to help you get excited about living the generous life and what that may look like. God has already given you so much. He has given you so much that you are likely in the 90 percentile, or actually wealthier than 90 percent of the population in the world. You hear me? You're living in the top 10 percent. If you make, if your household income is $35,000 or more, you are in the top 10 percent of wage earners in the world. Do you hear me? You are wealthy and worldly standards. And you may think, good grief, I can hardly buy groceries. I know, I understand, but it's, it's, the, it's the deal. We are in this category of wealth, but we don't understand ourselves as having it. So let me ask you a question. 
How many of you love being below average? Anybody love to be below average? I talked to Tim Saya just before this service started. I said, you have to keep your hand down because he's a golfer. And when you golf, you love to be below par. That is your goal. I want to be below average in golf. That's the only exception. So, you know, we don't, we don't think about that. We don't think, oh my goodness, I, I'm striving to be mediocre. I want to be below average. But that, unfortunately... It's the way many of us are when it comes to giving. We are below average and not living the generous life that God has designed us to be. Studies have actually shown that those people who are in the bottom 20% of earning, maybe even just in America, if you're in the, in the lower 20 percentile of earnings, on average you give two times the percentage of those in the top 20% of earnings. Let that sink in. So you make much less, but you give percentage-wise more, sometimes twice as much as those in the top percentile. Now, that's not dollar amount. It doesn't make sense. But typically, the more blessed we are financially, the smaller the percentage we give. And, and, I, and I think I know why that is. I think it's because the amount is bigger, isn't it? We start looking at it and we think, oh, if I give this much, ooh, that's a lot of money. But we don't consider the percentages on what we're earning. And, and folks, that's really, the percentage is so much smaller, it's not really generous giving at all. We're giving out of our excess. It's not using our wealth well. It's not being rich in what really matters the most. We, we like generosity, from others, don't we? We like receiving things from others. We even like the way we feel when we are generous, maybe at Christmas or something like that. But the truth be told, we are not good at practicing generosity when it comes to returning back to God. Now, we do excel in things, especially as Americans. We excel in shopping, spending, consuming, and I could add overeating and a lot of other things, but we won't get in there. It starts to meddling. Americans are really, really good at that. Some of us are so good at spending that we actually spend more than we earn. And some people even spend more than they have. And they find themselves in incredible debt. We live in a nation and among a people uh, that excels in spending and consuming more than any other country in the world. And neither of these is honoring to God or being faithful to all that God has already blessed you with. Now, when you were growing up, did you ever get lectured about taking care of your things? I know as a parent, I started lecturing my kids because I got lectured about taking care of my things. If I left my bike out in the rain, I would usually get a whipping first and then a lecture ne next. You know, you're not taking care of things. You, you are not showing that you appreciate what you have. And, and I, didn't, I didn't show that I was appreciating it. Um, having a bike was very important to me because I rode it to school every day. And one time I left it outside. And you know what? It got stolen. And I felt the repercussions of that because my parents did not run out and buy me a new bike. They did not even drive me to school. There was no car line when I was growing up. There was a bicycle line and walkers. You either rode the bus or you walked or rode your bike to school. That was it. If a parent brought you to school, it was because you had been sick and they brought you and said, get out, you're fine, go in there. You missed the bus. It became very clear to me quickly that I had not appreciated the fact that I had a bicycle. I had not taken care of it. And so I had to walk to school for a long time until I finally got a new one. And it probably came at a birthday or Christmas or something like that. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that many of us are not taking care of God's blessing the way God wants us to. Now, we believe that God has blessed us already. 
not so that we can use it all up on ourselves, but rather that the blessing become, ha, comes with a responsibility. To use uh, spiritual terms, the, the blessing comes with a calling. God has given you much so that you can be generous with it, so that you can bless others with it. Why? One reason is that God wants you now. He wants you to enjoy what he's given you. That's very clear. No doubt about it. There's nothing sinful, nothing unspiritual about enjoying the blessings of God. Much like a, a, a father wants to bless his children, he wants them to enjoy it. 1 Timothy six seventeen says this. It says, Command those who are rich in this pre- present world not to be arrogant, but to put their, and, nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Look at this next part. Who richly provides us with everything, look at the last part, for our enjoyment. He blesses us with everything for us to enjoy, but he wants us to realize that what he has given us is not all for us. He intends for us to share this. 2 Corinthians 9.11 says this, you will be enriched in every way. Why? Here's the why. So that you can be what? Generous. Yeah, I want you to help read along with me. So that you can be generous when on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. It becomes an act of worship. It becomes a way to elevate God in your life. And you know what this is saying? It's saying God provides you with everything you have. You take some of it and you enjoy it. And then you share with someone else. So they turn and give thanks to God for your faithfulness. Giving to others feels good. That's why we we take up an offering at church. Now, I don't know what your attitude is when you drop something in the plate or you make a contribution online or whatever, but when we stand to sing the doxology to God, I wonder if your heart is joyful and you're thinking, I have brought my best and my first to God, and here it is. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Is that the way you feel? Or do we come and we go, I have seen people sit in the pew and write their checks for an offering on a Sunday morning. And you could almost sense the trust going out. Their hands may be shaking. Because they realize it is a sacrificial gift. You realize that they are doing their best to put God first in their light. Lord, I'm trusting you with this. And so when they stand and sing, they are saying, God, all right, I've given you what you've asked. And I'm asking you for a blessing in return. You see, we need to do better with our wealth. Generous living means remembering three things. That God has blessed me with more than I need. In the eyes of the world, I am rich. Second thing, as a follower of Christ, I do not put my trust in riches, but rather in the God who richly provides. That's where my faith is, not in the paycheck. And three, because I have more, I need to give more. People who want to live generously and bless generously can never be below average givers. God calls us to excel at the grace of giving, and the reason is He is inviting you to be a part of of Him making a difference by using what God has already given you. I have two big thoughts, and these are going to kind of be broken into two spaces, but the two big thoughts. Number one, truly blessed or generous people give strategically. Strategic giving is one of the big things that God asks us for. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, 
for God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. So what does this mean? It means that you've taken the time to pray and to think about your gift. If you're married, you've talked with your spouse about it. You've asked God for direction, and then you give. Now think about it. You know, when you love someone, and you plan to give them a gift, maybe it's their birthday, an anniversary, Christmas, something like that, you put a lot of thought into it. You listen for hints of things that they might like. You observe to see what they might like in their life. And after you do this, you consider the gift and you purchase it. And then you get all excited when they go to open it, don't you? Because you're thinking, oh my goodness, they're going to like this. And because you know how much time and energy that, that you've put into this and how much love that you've put into this, you realize it is a cheerful gift. You cannot wait for them to receive it. I think of little kids at Christmas time that actually take time to, to uh, suggest what present to give mom or dad. I won't say buy it because they probably didn't. But, and then they take the time to wrap it. And you can tell it's from them because it is wrapped like a kid wraps. You know, half a roll of tape and a whole roll of wrapping paper. And they are so excited. They're like, open mine, open mine, open mine, open mine. Because they are so excited about their expression of love that they cannot contain it anymore. And I wonder, do we approach God the same way? God, I cannot contain how excited I am about what I get to give back to you. The challenge is that most of us have more than we need. But we just give spontaneously instead of strategically. And we need to give strategically as well. Spontaneity uh, is fine. It's, it's like throwing a 20 in or, or maybe giving 100 or $500 toward a relief effort or something like that. And sometimes those props come from God them, himself. But those things are good. But if, if it's the only way that we're giving, then we're missing out on so much more, on trusting God with even a better life. We are limiting. We are limited without making a strategic prayerful difference strategic giving starts it starts with what the bible calls the tithe micah three ten says bring the whole tithe into the storehouse but there may be that there may be food in my house test me on this says the lord almighty and see if i will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it And you say, well, that's an Old Testament thing. That 10% thing, that's an Old Testament thing. Well, yes, it is. They used a barter system, a trade system. We use cash, but the principle is the same. Tithing is the starting place. 10% of your income. Given back to God. God gives you 100% of everything you have, and you give him back 10%. He says, hey, keep the 90. Does that change your... Thinking about it a little bit? Everything I have was given to God. If I'd have walked up to you and handed you uh, 10 $10 bills and said, uh, here, these are for you. Oh, can I have one of those back? You'd go, sure. Because you didn't, you didn't, it didn't generate from you in any way in the first place, right? And you go, sure, here. And I say, you keep the rest. You're like, sweet. But somehow when we get the paycheck in, we like, I don't know. It changes, doesn't it? changes this is ground floor giving though and it is a spiritual act of worship it is truly sacrificial in nature let me give you two reasons that I tithe one tithing teaches me and reminds me to put God first it teaches me and reminds me to put God first. Every month, it reminds me to put God first. And you say, well, that's easy for you. You're a preacher. Folks, I haven't always been a preacher. And I still get a paycheck once a month. And sometimes I groan when I write my tithe check. But it reminds me, it teaches me to put God first. Deuteronomy 14.23, this is a living Bible translation, says this, Bring this tithe to eat before the Lord your God at the place he shall choose as his sanctuary. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, 
and the firstborn of your flocks and herds. Remember, they were a bartering country. So these are the, the first fruits of everything you have to trade with, everything you have to, to buy and sell with. Look at this last part. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. I will give God my first and my best, and I will trust Him with all the rest. Some of you, I know, you're thinking, gosh, I wish I hadn't come to church today. Others of you are thinking, 10%, good grief, Jay, we're already on a shoestring. If I were to tie 10% off the top, I would have to totally and completely rearrange my life. I would have to cut some things out, I, I, I know. And, and you know what? If that's the case, maybe this is God holding up a sign to you that's saying, hey, I'm not a priority. If this is difficult for you, maybe your priorities need to get checked. If I'm going to be first in your life, if you're going to be my child and you're going to be devoted to me and follow me, if you're going to say Jesus first in my life, then maybe I need to consider this because this is a major thing in my life. Money is a very easy God to bow to. Tithing forces us to do something tangible in our lives and put God first. You want to do something in your relationship with God? You want to do something that says, God, I want to show you that, that I belong to you and that you are my priority in my life? Start here. Start here. Some of you could do this very easily, but you don't because you're below average givers. Some of you are thinking, financially, I, I, I can't. We, we are those that we spend it all the way to the end. It is gone every month. Well, you need to start incrementally chipping off a piece of that, maybe 1%, then 2%, then 3%. And slowly get to where you can give God what He's asking of you. The second thing tithing does is it increases your faith, increases my faith in God. You see, it doesn't make sense that 90% of my income with God's blessing will go further than 100% without it. But it does every single time. It is, it is amazing. It always does. You see, it takes faith to give to God first. It takes no faith to give God leftovers. Tithing is the only area in the Bible where God gives us permission to test him. We just read it in Micah 3.10. He says, test me and see if I will not throw open the floodgates and pour out my blessing on you. He's like, give it a try. And if you're not a tither yet, take the test. Have that conversation with God on your knees and tell Him, okay, I'm going to take you up on this test. Next month, I'm going to give you 10% off the top. I'm going to put Christ first in my finances, and I'm going to trust you with the rest. I want to give strategically, so I will start with tithing. So the first way we give is strategically. The second way we give is extravagantly. And this is the bonus on top. We talk about tithes and offerings. Tithes are what, what God has asked us to give. Offerings are above that, are beyond that. If we are living generously because God has blessed us so, then we will learn to give extravagantly. Solomon was a wise and wealthy man. When he took the role as, as king, he was required to make an offering, a bull offering, a sacrifice that was required of all kings when they took the throne. But he was also a man of extravagant wealth, and he was an extravagant giver as well. So instead of one bull, he sacrificed 1,000 bulls. He learned this from his father David, who modeled generosity for him. When David saw that the temple in Jerusalem was broken down, he gave extravagantly of his own personal wealth. Scholars tell us that if, if we were recording the, the dollar amount today, it would be the equivalent of billions of billions of dollars that he contributed to the building of the temple. Why? Because he wanted God to have the very best. He wanted to express it in the most powerful way that he could 
In Mark 14, we read the story of a woman of questionable reputation that pours perfume on Jesus' feet. You remember this story? The perfume was valued at a year's wages. Think about what you earn. Imagine buying a bottle of perfume that costs that much money. Why did she do it? Because she loved Jesus so much. Because she was blessed. Because she wanted to be an extravagant giver. I have been forgiven so much, therefore I am going to give extravagantly. Now here's the deal. You don't have to give big amounts to give extravagantly. Extravagance is all about your heart. It is an expression of great and deep gratitude to God and love for Him. And out of that comes this flowing of thanksgiving. So the question for us this morning is this. Number one, do you love Jesus? Is He the priority in your life? Is it about Jesus and His kingdom? Is it about uh, furthering His kingdom, making sure His name and His renown are known, that lives are transformed? Is it, is it how can we contribute and, and give to God what is already His? Is your giving a reflection of your love and gratitude to God for all that He has already given you? And only you can answer that. So maybe we can all have a little talk with God about our giving. God, where am I? And it may be that God says, you're right, giving right exactly what I want you to. What I've asked of you. And you may have a peace beyond peace. But others of us, it stirs. It stirs us. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer now and just ask Him to help us. Lord, help me to listen as much as I want to talk. Help me to listen as much as I want to explain to you why I give as much or as little as I do. Faith to trust you with all that you have already given me. Help me to trust you with today so that I can trust you with tomorrow. Father, open our hearts to be faithful with all that we have. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.